Thank you very much, Michael, and thanks very much for the plug about the golf umbrellas. When, when my daughters say, well, what, what are you known for? And I said, I'm known for being the first person to use a golf umbrella in London instead of those silly little black things that blow inside out and that you leave on trains. And so that's how they'll remember me. So thank you very much. And I must say to Kim and all the others, this is very exciting. Um, you know, you know, to have, like as Villa said, to turn policy into action is, is sort of extremely sort of exciting. And so to take all of the wonderful policy that was sort of developed by the Commission and then turn it into, well, how do we put this policy into, into place is superb. So I'll, I'll, start, I'll start with this, and this is what I started with my TED talk as well. This is a picture of my grandfather and myself in the streets of Sydney and for those of you who don't remember the mid-1950s, there, there were street photographers. So not many people had cameras and so this was taken by a street photographer with me proudly carrying his bag. About four or five years later, my grandfather died at home in 1959. Almost everyone's grandfather died at home in those times. And that was just the normal way things happened. And why was that? It was because there wasn't much in hospitals that wasn't in the general practitioner's bag. So that's not all that long ago, but there was only a very limited amount of surgery. There was very poor sort of anaesthetics. There were general wards, only a few sort of antibiotics and, and sort of intravenous fluids were, you know, was only just beginning. And then there was this tsunami of sort of incredible advances in hospitals. And so they became the self-proclaimed flagships of healthcare. So we moved from the general practitioner to the hospitals. Ways of diagnosing people, ways of keeping people alive, fantastic, extraordinary things that were happening. However, for all the good that it's done, there has been some downsides. And one of the downsides is this tsunami of everyone coming into hospitals for minor illnesses and for illnesses whether they can be cured or not. And as Villas mentioned, about 70% of our population now die in acute hospitals whether their illness can be cured or not. Why is that? Well, our population's getting older. Most, most patients in hospital are over the age of 70. People want to die at home, but they die in hospitals. And so we have this sort of conveyor belt into the hospitals where if you get sick these days, there wouldn't be many of us who just watch someone with a serious illness. So you call an ambulance. The ambulance has no sort of discretionary power, not in this country or very little. So they take you to the nearest emergency department and the emergency department is into packaging because there's pressures on them to push the patient out of ED and it's much easier for them to admit the patient to the general ward than it is to do all the complex ringing around in order to send them back home again. And then of course they come into the wards and then I get a call from one of my colleagues, a very well-meaning doctor who says, Ken, this patient's very sick and I've had a chat to the relatives and they want everything done and their words that send horror into anyone who works in intensive care because it then makes us very difficult, you know, makes the whole situation very difficult for us because now the patients and the carers have got the expectation, now they're coming into intensive care and their life is going to be saved. Whether they're 95 with dementia and multi-organ problems, it doesn't matter. So I guess that gets back to Kim's work here in that if we can educate nurses and doctors to have more honest discussions with patients, then we wouldn't be getting so many of these calls um, sort of asking for further and more incremental care. So it's not surprising that dying has become medicalised and choices have gradually incrementally been taken off people. And it hasn't been a conspiracy, it's just happen because we can do things, we do do things. Some of the drivers are dying is frightening, 
sometimes there's a lack of community support for as much as we say that coming into hospital is not such a good thing, there has to be a rapid way of transporting patients to the community and, and providing equal if not better care, a different sort of care. And this occurs in some countries like Scandinavia, it's coming here but it's not universal. Societal expectations, every day there's another sort of medical miracle. It's different, it's difficult to be 100% certain, so doctors are conservative and they'll always go to the fallback position of, well, we should just try a little bit of this, a little bit of that, because there's always hope. And because we can do things, we do do things. Litigation is probably not so important in our country, but in other countries certainly a very important driver. What I'd like to mention here, and this isn't, this isn't a criti criticism of my colleagues, but we've divided our, 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 you know, the whole of medicine into specialties. And this, this is very much a part of Australian medicine. Other countries have moved away into more general physicians admitting patients. But here we divide the body into organs and you were admitted under a specialist organ. Now when you're 85 years of age, with some renal failure, some liver failure, a little bit of dementia, cardiovascular failure, previous TIA strokes, high cholesterol, etc., it's very difficult to know which organ that person belongs to. And so I'm sure those of you who work in clinical practice see this all the time, of which one will it be? comes under the heart, the heart complains that the problem was in the lung and, the, and you know, the heart's only secondary to the problem, etc. And so that, that's a big problem. And also these are very well-meaning doctors who aren't necessarily comfortable with talking about death. And that's why what you're doing is extremely important because most of us come through a system where we're taught about making people better. That's the job of doctors. And there's only one lecture in the whole six years in my university course, apart from palliative care, which talks about death and dying. The rest is about making the diagnosis and making you better. It's not surprising for many of you to know that dying is not recognised in acute hospitals. We actually set up this rapid response system, which is in most hospitals in Australia. A large study that we've done with Canada and the UK and Australia has found that one third of all of these calls are for people at the end of life. So that's more than 150,000 calls per year in my state alone. So this, this system, which was meant to save people's lives, has turned into the surrogate dying system. People are not recognised as dying in our hospitals, which is extraordinary. The same with emergency departments and intensive care. Many of our patients slip through these systems, are not recognised as people who are at the end of life. So these conversations don't happen. So it's just this conveyor belt, because we can do things, we do do things. Are hospitals good places to die? No, they're not. They're good places if you're sick and you can get better, but they're not good places. And this is just one of many studies to say that acute hospitals are not the best places to go if you are at the end of life and need a different management plan. So these are some of the, some of the policy statements from the Commission. And I always call it the Commission because I can never remember what all, the other, <laughs> what all the other letters stand for. So these are superb, and there was a lot of work went into this with a lot of people involved. But I'll come back to Villas's point in that we need to translate this into action. We need to translate this into implementation. At the moment in Denmark, they've changed their whole system. One is not allowed to have policy anymore whether it's in health, roads, or whatever. These departments have been changed into policy and implementation. The two have to go hand in hand. So instead of having statements, they have to be linked, well, how can we do this? And if we can do it, how do we measure that it's been done appropriately? 
So the, so the two areas which have been separated for many years are now combined and, and I believe this is also becoming part of Norway and Sweden as well. So I like, I like Phyllis's statement here that we need to be turning policy into action and that's where the end of life essentials is so important and also a relatively unique sort of initiative in health. It's taking all of the Commission's work and it's putting it into action, turning policy into clinical practice. So there can be few, I'll just concentrate on the last letters there, there can be few endeavours that are more important than this in health. Because if you, if you, if you just look at the cost of the inappropriate admission and management of people at the end of life in hospitals, it's probably the major contributor to the unsustainable cost of healthcare. Now, I know we shouldn't talk about cost, but that's important. But far more important is that these people are not being treated well in acute hospitals. And it's probably not their choice if they were given choices. Kim asked me to talk about um, sort of a clinical example. And so I thought I'd talk about my mother. And here she is 48 hours before she died. She was 86 years of age. She was admitted to acute hospitals 22 times in the last six months of her life. All problems that in theory could be cured by hospitals, a minor urinary tract infection, a minor fall and whatever. Nobody explained to her what was happening, what was wrong with her. I was her son, not the doctor, and so I wanted to stay right out of the situation until one day a very special doctor came along, sat myself and brothers and sisters down and said, look, your mother's dying. And what, what we're doing here is cruel. He didn't say what we're doing, but what we are doing is cruel. And I think that we should make the last few days of her life comfortable. And that was such a relief. But before then, she'd been treated by the very best specialist, all working on their own organs and sort of incrementally making them better, whereas in fact she was at the end of her life. What did my mother die of? Well, she died of old age. Now, you're not allowed to write that on death certificates these days. You have to make up something. So an 86-year-old person with 15 comorbidities, what do you write down? And every young doctor always asks me, what do you write down? And I say, make it up, because we don't know what they die of. Their heart stops, so I say, write down cardiovascular failure. So it's not surprising that death in the over 60s from cardiovascular failure is the most common way of dying. And that gets translated into research. Let's pour all our money into preventing cardiovascular failure. So there's a lot of implications for death certificates and 40% of them are wrong anyway, even the ones that aren't made up. So it was always difficult to, to, to say what my mother died of. It was the organs gradually age and become dysfunctional. What drove me mad was that she ring me up twice or three times a week and say, well, what's wrong with me, Ken? You know, if only they'd tell me what was wrong with me, then they could make it better. And then I wouldn't have to go in and out of hospitals. And this gets back to the obsession still with diagnosis in medicine. And that's how we're all trained. You do a history, physical examination, provisional diagnosis, a few tests, and you come up with a single diagnosis. Now that occurs sometimes in hospitals, but not very often these days. It's not one thing that's wrong with you. It's the combination of the so-called comorbidities or age-related issues, which add up to something that as yet hasn't got a name or a number. Although I do like the concept of frailty. And I like this one best of all. There are about 20 frailty scores, but this one's got pictures. And, and so it's easy for me to relate to this. There's very well when you're in, in your 60s and 70s, and then you gradually become more frail. This is called apoptosis. It's, it's, it's there at conception about how long your tissues and organs are going to live for. And then gradually you become more frail. And I think that's going to become far more important in the very near future. And it's not curable. 
age-related frailty is not curable. So how do we get off this conveyor belt? It sort of makes me proud that Australia is, is sort of one of the countries that's leading in this area with Kim's work here and with many other areas to recognise people at the end of life with some numbers and some research. So when they arrive at an emergency department, we sort of know who these people are. We sort of know who they are now anyway. But, but sort of doctors like to have a name or a number. And so there's a lot of work in Australia on this. What do we do about it after we recognise turning the theory into action, <clears throat> bearing in mind uncertainty? Uncertainty is a part of medicine. It's, it's just inherent in medicine. And so a 20-year-old with a brain tumour, you might say, well, you've got 12 months to live, and that might be six weeks, it might be three years, and there'll, all, there'll always be uncertainty. But we can sort of at least begin the, the discussion. And so the response, once we've recognised people near the end of life, is to have an honest and empathetic discussion. And believe it or not, well, I'm sure many of you in the audience know this, this does not often occur in acute hospitals. People avoid it for many reasons. And that's why the education part of, you know, of, of the program that you're all developing here is crucial. It will help people to think about, well, this patient may be at the end of life now. How do I have this discussion? And following that discussion, choices, patient choices then we need, in view of the honest discussion, to say, well, what would you like to do in the remaining few months, year, two years of your life? And then you need to give them options. Do, do you want to continue to come in and out of hospitals? Some people would, but when you've had an honest discussion about, about sort of prognosis, maybe some people don't want to come in and out of hospitals. I know many older people do not like coming in and out of hospitals towards the end of their life. So the long-term solutions, I won't go into details here, but they're not in the acute hospitals. We all know that. 70% of Australians want to die in their own home. That's where we need to put resources to make sure that they are supported appropriately and their carers and friends and other people. Um, and here I could be a little bit controversial while we need to relieve symptoms of the older person in their home, there are other things that are just as important. Respite care for the carers and support for the cleaning of the home and meals and all that sort of thing. So medicalisation of dying, this is like medicalisation of birthing in the 50s and 60s. And I was at the end of this era where women having babies were sent to hospital strung up, lithotomy, baby taken away, baby put with all the other babies. Um, father's not allowed to be involved. I was actually at the end of this era. Fathers were not allowed into the labour unit and had to stand outside the glass doors to be trying to identify which of the babies was their particular one. That's changed now. And, so we, and, and that's changed because we've empowered People. We've empowered our society. We've been honest with our society about end of life. So this is a win-win, isn't it? We could radically reduce health expenditure, but even more important, we could provide appropriate care for people, care that they want at the end of life. So when we look at the history of medicine, there was this emphasis on diagnosis and cure, and then on public health and disease prevention. I think we're moving into an era where end of life is becoming as important as these first two. It's inevitable, but it's not part of our, it's not part of our thinking, our thinking in medicine, nor the thinking of our society, that death is inevitable. I know it sounds trite, but it, it needs to be embedded in our society, into our health services and system. So what's the most difficult? difficult ethical dilemma facing science today. This was given to a group of quite famous people and Sir David Attenborough said, how far do you go to, to preserve an individual human life? And Stephen Hawkins says, yes, that's a good one. So thank you very much.
Sorry, I meant, I, meant, I meant to open it as well. I've got no idea how you open something. I've never actually opened anything in my life. And uh, I'm looking for the champagne thing and, and whatever. But, uh, you know, like, like I guess that what I'd like to do is to sort of congratulate all of you who have been involved in this. This is extremely important. This is sort of amazingly important. And hopefully the start of many other similar, similar sort of initiatives in our country. So thanks very much to all the people involved. Thank you.